format today for everyone. Uh, we'll have uh, some comments and, and sharing from the Senator. We'll have a little bit of discussion on some of the key issues we wanted to talk about today. And then we're gonna open it up to Q&A, which he is really, really great at. And we'll try and get to as many of your questions as possible. Make sure you put them in the Q&A button. We're not looking at the chat today. So that's how we'll handle it. And we've got him all the way up to about one o'clock. And I know there's a lot to talk about. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, Oregon Senator Ron Wyden. Welcome. Katie, thank you. What an inflationary introduction. And uh, <laughs> suffice it to say, I've so enjoyed coming to Ben Chamber meetings over the years and Zoom is our option for today, but I can tell you, I'd really like to get an invitation to come back and do this in person because I really have gotten a lot out of the meetings and Zoom is the option that we're dealing with today, but nothing is better than having Oregonians kind of look you in the eye. And I wanna save most of the time um, for questions. Obviously the Recovery Act has passed about 60% of it went to the Senate Finance Committee, where I'm the chairman. I was on the floor of the Senate for something like 26 hours straight, dealing with amendments and negotiations and the like. But it has some really key components, obviously, for Central Oregon. And by the way, I'll be in Central Oregon. On Monday, we have virtual town halls, and what I always do is I come to the community and then listen to folks and after a while, uh, and they've had a chance to air their concerns. I go for a walk on Main Street or visit with some businesses, approaches that are socially distant. So I'm looking forward uh, to doing um, that, but it's pretty clear that the high desert is a real priority for recovery in Oregon. And let me just tick off a, a few of the elements that are gonna make uh, that easier. First, there's real money for vaccinations. And I'm of the view that when we get folks vaccinated, employers will start hiring again. By the way, the unemployment challenge is even greater in the metropolitan areas than it is in um, the rural areas. And I think it's just the law of the, the marketplace. You get folks um, vaccinated, employers will start hiring, and that ought to you know, bump up wages, not because of anything other than normal supply and demand. And I think that'll be good for workers, that'll be good for small um, businesses. Now, a couple of issues have been really key uh, for me. Broadband uh, that Katie just mentioned uh, today, and I think I'll get a positive reaction from the Federal Communications Commission. I said that it is time in 2021 say that broadband will be what electricity was years ago, something that everybody has got to have. And in the December bill, and the Federal Communications Commission will be announcing this soon, uh, I was able to get help for workers and small businesses that are uh, doing their business uh, remotely and for families and uh, students, they'll be announcing those uh, details, but Senator, I believe that you are are muted. Could people hear any of now what you're we on. Said? Now could, you're on. Could, could any people have heard? Did people hear any of what we talked about earlier? I think that we left off just as you were talking about the broadband. Okay, great. I mean, everybody in Central Oregon understands how important that is. You can't have big league quality of life in Central Oregon with little league um, communications, and so I have made it clear that I want broadband. Um, treated like electricity was years ago. And I think the Federal Communications Commission is going to encourage that position. And right now they're implementing a program that I got passed in December that provides additional funds for folks who are working remotely, for kids and families where they're also getting educated remotely. And I think you'll get more details and we'll get that information to you um, very quickly. Now we're moving on to the next package, which is infrastructure. 
roads and bridges and airports and um, the like. Uh, people are asking me, uh, how are you going to you know, pay for it? I mean, the budget's about choices. I, I think that there are programs at the federal level, and we can talk about it, whether it's containing you know, health care uh, costs, whether it's special interest you know, tax breaks. There are a variety of areas where I think we ought to say, this is a place uh, where you make a change in order to free up uh, funds for those areas that are inherently governmental which are priorities like roads and airports and, as I said, um, communications um, earlier. I think what we ought to do is <clears throat> get ready to get, to get to questions, but I want to mention the River Democracy because um, the River Democracy program that I've outlined in, in legislation is really a tip of the hat to Central uh, Oregon where recreation has always been a big economic engine. And what we propose is adding something like 4,600 miles of additional rivers that would be protected. And it's not a bill written in Washington, DC. It comes from nominations in Oregon. For example, a group of sixth graders from Pacific Crest Middle School nominated Tumalo Creek. So uh, whether it's roads, whether it's broadband, whether it's recreation, these are some of the key uh, pieces of the puzzle. And what I'd like to do, um, Katie, is use this kind of as a warm up for the virtual uh, town hall on April 15th. I hope folks will participate in that as well, but let's go right to, uh, to questions. And I wanna mention one other area. The biggest challenge in DC is trying to get bipartisanship. I was able to do that recently when it came to making sure that Oregon's small businesses were able to get the tax deductions for expenses associated with PPP loans. Nobody thought we could do it. And I just went to the Republican leadership and I said, look, uh, this was still when I was the ranking Democrat. I said, this is not de about Democrats and Republicans. This is about protecting our small businesses at a time when they're getting clobbered. So, that's what we're trying to do. Katie, you're on mute. Let's see if it's us or you. God, somebody's always got to do that. So yep. Okay, okay, you're here. I'm glad I'm here. And, and Katie, I think I I uh, gave one wrong date out. The town hall is April 5th. Okay. Thank you for that. <clears throat> So there's a lot to unpack with this, um, this new bill, the American Rescue Plan Act, I believe it's called. So, so many different aspects of it. We've had so many folks um, calling in, writing into the chamber of how to access it. So um, if you could help just describe what this is like, if you are a small business owner you've suffered um, a lot of damage from the pandemic and the recession. Um, what is different about this PPP package than the prior one and, and what's, what's the same? Well, what, what's different, Katie, is this is much more focused on small businesses. You'll recall that the first one was Ruth Chris and all these big businesses. This one was kicked off, for example, with a special lane, a kind of special time period for the small businesses. And we're also using more community-based, you know, financial um, institutions. And we've got this information online. Uh, Jacob is there in Central Oregon. I tell everybody who's got a question, call them nights and weekends. But what this is based on, and this was something that did not come from our committee. This was um, one of the few pieces that didn't come from our committee. This new version really picks up on some of the areas that small businesses were concerned about initially. I think we remember the first PPP package and those early CARES packages and small businesses were saying, what's in this for me? This doesn't resemble anything that I can actually use. Right. And that is a big difference. Um, what we have found in our membership, Senator, is those who, many of those who are most impacted are small and they're customer facing. So um, folks who are in the events, hospitality business, 
um, recreation, tourism, um, anybody who's who's got to sit down across from a, a customer or be in the same room. It's been it's been a rough year, as you know. So we're still hovering around seven percent unemployment here, and about three thousand of those jobs are folks in the recreation and hospitality industry. So they're exactly who you've been talking about. So the unemployment um, payments have been extended to September 1st. Can you tell us a little bit about, I, we know a lot of checks went out the door already, which was astounding really that they got out within days of, of the announcement. But if you are, um, I don't know, a, not a rafting guide, but, but somebody who works in a restaurant and you know that you may or may not be able to go back to work this summer. How is this new package helping you? Well, this also brings some clarity to who is eligible for unemployment. So Katie, let me describe how the system works because we Oregonians have been particularly frustrated. I was able to get the extra money for unemployed workers twice initially the $600 and uh, then the most recent payment, $300 in coverage for the gig workers and the self-employed and independent contractors, of which there are many um, in Central Oregon. But the program is actually administered by the Oregon Employment Division. And the Oregon Employment Division had enormous problems early on their technology is so out, outdated. And it got to the point where I had to do what I've never done in my time in public service. I asked the governor to replace the person who's heading the Oregon Employment Division. So yeah. things have gotten better. There's still a backlog. People who are having problems, again, should let us know. But what I'm hearing based on my scientific study which is going to Fred Meyers and Safeway. I love both of those stores in Central Oregon. Uh, people are not having as many problems. Now, I also want Oregonians to know what's coming up. And you may hear about it in the next few days. I think it's time to get away from setting arbitrary dates for unemployment because for small businesses and for workers, it doesn't give them the predictability and the certainty they need. So I want to tie future unemployment benefits to economic conditions on the ground. So what that means is if unemployment goes down, then the benefit tapers off. If unemployment is high, the benefit reflects what people need to make rent and pay groceries. I'm very hopeful that we'll get bipartisan support. That's really interesting. I'll look forward to seeing more about that. Um, one of the, the, the questions that we have gotten from our businesses is, uh, and actually this is a question from several businesses. So in the recreation, hospitality industries, it's, it's been hard to fill those positions as we've started to reopen as a state to a certain, certain level. So labor um, in some of these employers' eyes is, has been hindered because folks are staying home because they, they feel like they can earn as much money staying home for a while rather than coming back. What would your response to that be? Well, you know, people basically aren't allowed, for example, when brought back to not come, you know, come, come back and do essentially what, what you're talking about, just get the benefit. They would have to say, for example, that it's tied to COVID or taking care of a relative and the like, but the employers have a valid point. You know, they're concerned about making sure that there are workers. I personally believe that most people wanna work, there's a dignity with, with work, but that's why I want the reform. Let's tie the benefits in the future to economic conditions um, on, on the ground. But, you know, if um, you've been working somewhere and you've been, you know, laid off and, you know, you're, you're called back, you can't just say, I don't feel like it and get an unemployment check. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. And another question um, that came in today from 
as you know, there are a lot of great events that happen in Central Oregon. We get lots and lots of visitors. There, there's just a ton of stuff to do on a normal year. Um, so part of this uh, rescue package was to provide money to ven vendors who had to shut down. But there's a whole nother segment of folks who are still a little bit confused that run uh, sporting events where the venue is the Deschutes National Forest or the road through town or, or whatever it happens to be. It isn't actually locked into a fixed venue. Um, and they are hurting as well as these event planners that, that put these on, they get sponsors, um, world-class stuff that happens here. What advice would you give to them as far as accessing PPP funds? We can get them information about the differences because initially when people heard about this, they thought about you know a venue, for example, it was downtown and in music and they closed and that's what everybody thought was right. the venue. And then a lot of us said, hey, in our state, that's largely the kinds of things you're talking about. Sometimes, it's, you know, it's nonprofit. You know, I was able to get help earlier on for the Shakespeare Festival because they were, you know, a nonprofit. So there are different kind of gradations of what constitutes a, a venue. We also were able in this new bill to get um, help for the restaurants. It's called the Restaurants Act is, is incorporated in this. So I think, again, while there are some unanswered questions, I think by and large, for what people customarily think are venues, there's an opportunity to get some help through one of these packages. Right. Okay, I'm reading through lots of questions coming in. Um, Let's see, let's talk a little bit about the, the scenic rivers for a minute. There's a lot of questions in the queue about that. Um, question, why, uh, let's see. How, uh, how have you gone about getting support? I, we've talked to your, your Jacob Egler, your, your staff person here and done a lot of work with uh, businesses and, and as a chamber to really explore this piece of legislation. And there are several questions around how were stakeholders engaged and what aspects of um, this piece of legislation do you think are really in response to those who are particularly landowners, not only along the banks of the river, but this also affects the, the aquifer as well. Um, what was the process of, of interacting with folks on that? And what are the what gives you the most confidence that um, where you're at right now is going around, along the right path as far as landowners? Well, Katie, we made explicit, and I can read everybody the section of the bill that you cannot interfere with private property. The private property is just off limits. Period. Full stop. What we said with respect to fire, which of course is so important in Central Oregon, that we wanted the land managers, and as you know, there are federal you know, land managers in Central Oregon, to work with the communities to, in effect, try to make sure that these um, corridors that we believe will reduce fire risk are actually implemented. But we thought it was very important over the year to listen to as many voices as we could. And we met with scores of business groups and landowners and rural counties. And I can tell you, I've had 970 opened everybody town meetings, had scores of virtual town halls, like the ones I'll be hosting in Central Oregon when I am in Central Oregon here in a few days. And by the way, I'm always open to suggestions. If we didn't get it right in an area, um, we want to know about it. I mean, a number of people asked, for example, about private property. And then I went to the particular section where it says, this is to expressly say there is to be no interference with private property and said, nobody told me about that. I heard all oh, the sky is gonna fall. Yep. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, I and I and I I think the other thing about this, Katie, is the way I legislate. And I'm Oregon's guy on this key committee, the finance committee taxes, and trade, and healthcare, and infrastructure. I believe in getting more input rather than less. So this is not a done deal. It's not sent down from some Mount, some tablet, Mount, Mount Sinai. I'm getting input on the unemployment issue, um, private employers, because uh, they've told me when I said here today, it's gotten better with the Oregon Employment Division but there's still problems. I'm trying to make the system of getting information more modern to produce legislation on that. I want to have a system that helps both small businesses and workers, which is why I'd like to tie benefits to economic conditions on the ground. Uh, I thought it made sense to particularly tie benefits to uh, COVID connected kind of situations that I, I mentioned. But none of this is set in concrete. The way I legislate is to get people's input and ideas. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, another, I think there are a couple of questions here where uh, we can um, provide you with your staff's information for folks who have more detailed questions about the act, uh, about this piece of legislation so they can get in direct contact with you and your, your staff. Um, Jake, Jacob was very involved yeah. in every bit of this, and we spent pretty close to a year repeatedly inviting people for comment. We always said we're still going to be open for comment, which is the case. So, Jacob, forgive us, but we're going to put your email address in the chat box. Jacob's life is going to be forever. <laughs> yeah. So that people can have access because there are several other questions in, in, in pretty many detail that um, I think would be better served directly with Jacob. Um, and, and Katie, re remember, our view is that recreation is an enormous economic engine in Central Oregon, our state. So whether it's guides, whether it's restaurants, whether it's people coming in after a day on the river for you know, cold, cold beer, staying somewhere in Central Oregon, coming by car and gassing up. Recreation is a big economic multiplier. And I believe we can get the upside without some downsides by legislation that's not you know crafted. We said expressly, there could be no interference with private property, if people have other areas that I'm concerned of, we're very open to that. Coming off the river on a sunny day with a cold beer sounds really good right now. <laughs> that's, that's really, really good. Happiness. <laughs> um, the, the chamber has looked at, at this issue quite a bit, and I, we would totally concur with your, your opinion that it is the river system in Central Oregon is absolutely one of the most important economic assets that we have. And we, we definitely support protection. One of the questions that has come up is uh, the one-to-one -one mitigation. So if you pull a cubic foot of water away, you have to replace the cubic foot. We just see this, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, as, as a real challenge. I know your team has been working hard with municipalities, jurisdictions, folks all over this aquifer on what do we do as a bazillion people move to Bend and we need to supply them with water and making sure that we have long-term supplies as we grow. Well, Katie, you pretty much answered your very good question. We're working with municipalities to really pick up on every one of those potential um, distinctions. And it kind of highlights what I said is, you know, you're gonna have a lot of people coming. Why are they coming? Because you have a spectacular, you know, quality of life and you protect the rivers and the rivers are a source of, um, of recreation and um, employment, but you gotta keep the drinking water, you know, clean, which is also a big reason why we have this bill because otherwise you could have exploitive developments, you know, dams, lines, you know, all kinds of, of yep. things. And 
remember when you're done with this bill, you still have a tiny fraction of Oregon's rivers with protection. So we said, let's take the places that Oregonians decide are most special. In other words, the way bills usually get written are not what we're doing here, which is working through all the specific aspects um, of it to try to get it um, right. Somebody goes to Washington, D.C., writes a bill and acts like they got all the answers. Well, 15,000 Oregonians gave us their opinions about how to start. Then we went out and talked to more people. Then we talked to various organizations and interest groups. And now I have the good fortune of being with you and saying, if your folks have ideas and suggestions, we're open to them. Yep. And I'm gonna close out that topic. Uh, there are a few questions from folks um, who represent miners, small scale mining. Um, and I, I would suggest you going directly to Jacob on this because they have um, concerns, ideas, and, and input to provide from that standpoint as well. I'm not as familiar with that, that industry here at the chamber. Um, so I wanna move on to a new topic and that is the pending infrastructure bill that, that's coming. And uh, for economic stimulus, for infrastructure investment, Everybody's talking about it. I know you have been right in the middle of that discussion and um, just wanna thank you publicly again for helping us get an infra grant. A couple of years ago, I was there with the city of Bend in your office <laughs> asking for your support and we ended I, up- I remember it well. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that's certainly gonna help with, with traffic around here, but there's, as you know, not enough fingers and toes to plug the holes in the dike. And um, so there, there's a lot of work to be done yet. What, um, what aspects do you think are most important in this bill as it's being developed? Well, I, I think we all understand that Central Oregon or Portland or Medford or any small or big size town it's a global marketplace and we've got to be competitive. And my own view is, is that people in politics sometimes talk a lot of nonsense in an election. They get up and say, you should vote for me because I created 5,000 jobs or 3,000 jobs. The jobs don't come from the private sector. Excuse me, don't come from government. They come from the private right. sector. <laughs> and uh, when people like me set the temperature right in terms of infrastructure, in terms of taxes, like I did with the PPP loans and protecting those write-offs for small uh, businesses, holding down healthcare costs, which I'm trying to do with prescription drugs and eliminating middlemen and the like. If government gets it right on things like taxes, infrastructure, healthcare, trade, then you all can go do your thing. And so that's what I'm trying to do um, in terms of this bill. You know, I hear about 97 all the time. You know, every time I'm over, you know, people talk about, you know, the basics and the airports and all of the, the keys to being able to get where you need to go for business and your family and the like in a cost-effective kind of way. And I'm trying to look at infrastructure, frankly, in a different way. I think your people asked um, this morning about a new effort I'm making with childcare. And I've decided that the childcare issue, you know, government sometimes doesn't get the message soon enough. Right now, we've got childcare demand from workers and employers that are going through the roof, staggering. So we have inadequate supply. So I'm proposing to the president, and some of it was included in the earlier Recovery Act, that we say child care supply is a new priority. And there is a special section of the Social Security program where funds can be made available to states and say to a central Oregon business that's trying to rehab or expand a child care program to meet those needs. So we're looking at infrastructure in a way that allows people like me to say, 
A, government could make a well-targeted investment here in increasing child care supply. So all of your 127 members that are listening to this could be in a better position to grow their private sector businesses because their workers see that there's new, a new way to take care of the chocolate. Mm -hmm. That was a longer answer probably than you wanted, but that's how I feel. No, you, that, I wanna talk to you more about the childcare thing because as you probably know, this has been one of our top priorities at the Ben Chamber for a good three years. And I serve on the State Early Learning Council and the direct correlation between businesses' ability to, to keep their, their employees on board and, and happy is inextricably linked to childcare. And it is a workforce issue and an economic issue as, long, as well as all the other things, like, I don't know, taking care of our, our precious kids and making sure they're, they're properly taken care of and they, their brain development happens uh, in, a, in a productive way. Um, but, but really, I think you hit the nail on the head. We have a childcare desert. It was that way before. Uh, the pandemic hit and we lost, I think, around 60, 65% of our child care providers here. And only one in three kids before um, from birth to pre-K even had a slot in this region, one in three. And now I don't even know what it is. We're waiting for the new data to come out. We're trying to get some programs um, implemented that lowers costs by sharing supplies, by um, putting together an apprenticeship program. We're hoping to uh, work through different regions that would take college students and pay them to learn how to be in early child and brain development and um, pursue that as a, a career path. But all of these things are, are little bits of the bigger piece that I think you just hit, hit on is, is that people don't get into childcare because you're gonna make money. It is a labor of love and it is economically not a super feasible model. So long-term change for a funding stream to help subsidize it, I said the word subsidize it, is probably going to be um, something that, that we as a country will have to talk about someday. And I, and I really appreciate what you're doing. And I read through your, your news release on, um, investing in childhood, in childcare. And I think you're on the right track for that. You know, it's, it's striking, Katie, I, you know, I mentioned the role of government in the private sector where, you know, government doesn't create jobs. Private sector folks do. I'm in the climate setting business. And in each of these areas, that's how I see my, you know, role. And what's particularly wrenching is Oregon is mostly a small business state. You know, we've got only a handful of big businesses. And so what we try to do is put our hands on and try to walk people through this. And I've you know, been giving out information about where people can go and Jacob and other kinds of places for more, in, more information because this is a hands-on business. I went to school on a basketball scholarship and people always say this is foul, it's a contact sport. It's a contact sport. It's why I do all these town meetings. Because I don't think DC has all the answers. And I want people to leave this call having a sense of, you know, uh, an outline of what some of the key issues are all about and how to get more information. Yep, I, I appreciate that. And uh, that's the childcare situation is going to take a while to untangle and to bring back online. But thank you for all your efforts on that. Deeply appreciated. So my, my Q and A queue is, is blowing up with questions about infrastructure. So we're gonna talk about some infrastructure. So earlier in the Q and A, somebody had mentioned um, that public buildings are also infrastructure. And I know that there are some projects here in Central Oregon. I know uh, Oregon State University Cascades has talked to you about the Innovation District. We have all sorts of ideas for what those bits of federal seed money could reap if we could match it with some of the efforts at the state and the local and the private sector level um, to blend. Um, so when we're looking at these infrastructure pieces, do you have a sense of 
every time an infrastructure comes through, it kind of has a flavor to it, where you're trying to focus the energy. What do you, what's your sense of, of where that money is going to go with this, this package? What kind of criteria will you be looking for? Well, you know, to me, and I assume you're talking about the package that the president, the debate the president is going to launch tomorrow. You're talking about the one you're talking yes, about. Yes, correct. I mean, you know, you all speak a language that sometimes the government doesn't, you know, pick up on. But things like return on investment, quaint, you know, idea. And um, for example, in the last recovery bill, I authored something called the Build America Bonds Program. It's a public-private, you know, partnership. The private sector really liked it, you know, tax credit bonds was used extensively. I was in Central Oregon and metro area extensively around the state. So what I try to do, and I gather the House has got a lot of interest on a bipartisan basis in this already, is to try to look at projects, look at their track record, go out and consult with you know people. And that's what I'll be doing when um, I'm in Central Oregon in a few days. I'm going to be taking questions again at the Bulletin and um, in these virtual town halls. But in a kind of rough kind of way, I say, where do you get the best bang for the dollar? And for example, during the Recovery Act, uh, initially, and the reason I felt so strongly about it, um, both Democrats and Republicans understood that those unemployment dollars, where people were in effect ordered by their government to go home, those were hugely beneficial to communities. I had breweries, for example, in Central and Eastern Oregon say they couldn't have survived if their workers didn't get that money to pay rent and groceries with hopes that they could be there when we get to the other side and they're vaccinated. So it's always a question of looking at the circumstances and it's why, as I mentioned earlier, I wanna tie economic benefits like unemployment to conditions on the ground. I think that responds to some of your employers, you know, concerns uh, about, um, about the benefits and how they're distributed. Right. So um, just continuing on the, the line of the infrastructure um, potential package, that um, there's, there's also a question in the queue about only shovel-ready projects. So there's concern that um, design, um, I know at OSU Cascades, there's an aspect of cleanup that has to happen before the shovel-ready can happen for the innovation district. Um, there's also design for a project that we're co-funding through our, we, we passed a local transportation bond and we're funding a multimodal, multimodal pedestrian and other mode bridge over 97. And so to, to bring it back, do you think there's a possibility that this package would also include some of the prep, which includes design, which includes the things that happen to make something shovel ready or do you think it's going to be, need to be pretty ready to go? Preliminary engineering's done. Here's this last dime. Go do it. Yeah, I, I think the country has seen in the last decade that this definition of kind of shovel ready sometimes kind of misses the point. I mean, in other words, you know, how do you make some of those judgments, and I'll, I'll tell you, I had a virtual town hall last year from OSU Cascades. I actually went there, and that was where I did my virtual you know, town hall. And uh, I got a briefing on um, the project, the innovation you know, project. I think it's a terrific project. And what I'm really struck by is this would help give students workforce skills as well as fill kind of the need for the region. Now, I believe 
when we beat this virus, and we will because we're Americans, and we get to the other side, there are going to be a lot of jobs that used to exist aren't going to be there, and there are going to be lots of new jobs, and people are going to need new skills for them. And we see that particularly in terms of people working remotely and a sense that that is going to be a very big portion of the future. Well, the innovation project is perfectly positioned to do that, is to help look at the new jobs that we're gonna have in Central Oregon. There are gonna be a lot of them because people love Central Oregon and its potential. And they're gonna need new skills. So I'm going to do everything I can in the days ahead to look at essentially all of the areas where we could get federal funds. And you may have seen that, because you read all the bills that I propose, I've got a big workforce package. And it's really based on just what I said, new jobs are gonna take new skills and funds from that program ought to be able you know, to be used out in the real world so that employers and workers and students can access them. So that's what Jacob is listening for, is when people want us to follow up as we have been on um, the innovation project, that we can get their specific suggestions. Great. I just wanted to pause for a moment. There's a lot of questions in the queue that are going back to um, the Scenic Rivers legislation. I just want to acknowledge that they are there. It's from um, minors. There are some folks who really want to interact with your staff on how that piece of legislation limits um, mining capabilities uh, along 4,700 miles of mineral withdraw areas, et cetera. I, I just, because there's a, a lot of chat going on, I wanna recognize you folks. And that I think that the best way to get that specific information um, is to work with the Senator staff and please get in contact with Jacob um, so that, that your input is, is provided as this legislation gets developed. Yeah. Katie, so we're really specific about it. We've talked to lots of minors and that's because my door is always open. And what we're gonna have to do is get specific suggestions and we welcome them for what they think is um, the best way to achieve the balance, which is to have this economic engine that produces billions of dollars in revenue for Oregon each year. That's with a B tied to rivers and protecting our special places, how you can have that. And um, we're anxious to hear their suggestions on how we can have that and uh, uh, we'll hear them out. Thank you for that. Um, Senator, I would like to talk just a little bit. This is kind of along the lines of infrastructure. It is infrastructure. I know you've done a lot of work in uh, broadband stuff. You, you alluded to that when we first started our discussion today. Do you, in, in, in Central Oregon, as you know, Bend and Redmond are an MPO together. Um, we're roughly 250,000 folks. But you take three steps outside of that area and we are really rural. And, and so we're Bend, but we're also a part of Central Oregon community. Can you talk to me a little bit more of how you plan on um, funding, as you said, just like getting electricity? I, I totally agree. And I think that our businesses would, that broadband and access to it is essential to uh, being a productive person anymore. So what does that actually look like? How do you plan on implementing it? Well, sure. Here are the numbers from the last two bills, the December bill and then the Recovery Act. Now, the December bill made available $300 million for broadband in rural areas and then additional money for tribal broadband. The rescue plan included $10 billion 
to help states build out broadband. And that included well over $150 million for our state. So what I announced, Katie, and this is what today's announcement was about, is every single time there's an infrastructure bill before the Senate Finance Committee. This is a pledge from me. This is not from Harry, Sally, Fred, so-and-so, me, the chairman of the Finance Committee. Every time there's an infrastructure bill before the Senate Finance Committee, I will push to include substantial broadband funding until we reach the day when broadband is like electricity came to be decades ago. That is a commitment, a pledge from me to debt. Thank you, Senator. So I uh, want to, again, switch the topic to housing. <laughs> okay. Can you fix that, please? <laughs> so, so you know our situation, but just to give you a taste, if you are lucky enough to even find a house, they are they're on the market three days or less now. In the last three months, uh, median uh, home costs has gone up 29%. We're in the 560, 580,000 median price now. Crazy, crazy price. And it, there are many, many reasons for it. I know this is a national issue. Can you, sh you share your thoughts on what can be done about this? Yeah, um, Katie, hugely important. I'm kind of surprised that we went on for close to an hour and we didn't get to <laughs> housing. Um, this is true everywhere. I'm um, sitting in my dining room in Southeast Portland, all over Southeast Portland. If there is a house you know, available, comes on the market on Tuesday and by Wednesday, they're flooded with offers and it goes for above asking price. And, you know, this is true everywhere. And this is taking an enormous toll on Oregon. I mean, if we're trying to deal with livability and opportunity and say somebody from another part of the country wants to come, they can't begin, you know, to afford housing. So this is really taking a toll. And let me kind of walk you through um, where we are. Now, the rescue plan had $25 billion in emergency rental assistance. And that has to be an effort where the small businesses, because so often they're landlords and they're hurting too, and tenants, you know, work through that. $10 billion for homeowners who need a hand and $5 billion for emergency uh, housing choice vouchers. These are something used in Bend and elsewhere for people who are either homeless or, as the government says, imminent risk of uh, homelessness. So there's a beginning there. But let me tell you what I'm going to propose shortly. I'm going to propose something called the Decent, Affordable, Safe Housing Act. And if I was a business person sitting there, I'd say it sounds like a nifty title, but how is he possibly gonna do that? We're going to try to take it in increments. And the first part that I'm gonna focus on is getting adequate shelter for children who are sleeping in parks and other places all over and, and you know, in the urban areas, they get picked up by taxis after being on the streets. In the rural areas, a school district might come and stop in the parks and pick up kids who've been out a night. Rural Oregon is pretty cold and, and wet. And so for the broader term, I'm gonna try to stake out some ground where in uh, pieces, we can begin to attack the longer term priorities. I mean, Oregon should not have kids being picked up, you know, at, at parks after spending the night. You can't learn that way. So those are the funds from the last two bills, December rescue plan. And what I'm going to propose um, 
going forward. One bit of good news is the low income housing tax credit, which is very popular in our state with both tenants and developers. I was able to get expanded the floor for the allotment. I think that will be very usable in uh, particularly in Bend. The other um, issue is the link between, and which I really, really appreciate with what you're saying, is the link between um, housing and, and shelter for children and the child care, human development aspect of it. And do you think there's an opportunity to link those two things together, safe place to live, and during the day, you're in a high quality, safe place to be? Um, and, and that's from birth all the way through school kids that come home from school as latchkey kids, I guess. Well, one, one bit of good news for those families and kids is the finance committee where I'm the chair significantly expanded the child tax credit in the most recent bill. It will last a year, but there are a group of us that are going to try to make it permanent. If we make it permanent, the people who are expert in the field think this will reduce child poverty by 50% in America. That's amazing. But, and, and, and by the way, Republicans have ideas on this too, and I have pledged on the floor of the Senate to work with them. Yep, that's, um, I've, I've seen some of the statistics that you're referring to um, about child poverty, and they are, they are linked. I, Totally believe that. Um, so let's talk a little, <laughs> a little bit about this, this crazy year as you've started out um, with a new administration and uh, bipartisan um, legislation moving forward um, and really getting us just focused on getting us out of the pandemic. And it's not, I'm not just talking about the Recovery Act. Also, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit more also about um, the distribution of the vaccines and um, is there is there a hundred percent backing of where we're going with getting as many vaccines out as quickly as possible is the first part of the question across the aisle. The second part of the question is, have you seen um, evidence that we will reach herd immunity enough people taking this if we get the supply out. Yeah. Um, if any of you saw the director of the Centers for Disease Control yesterday in our press conference, did you see that by any chance, Katie? Yes. Uh, she's a doctor, treated COVID patients. She's been on the front lines and you saw in her face and the effort to choke back the tears that she feels that the next few weeks are huge. And I've been mentioning playing basketball. Don't give up the game before the buzzer is over. People are really hurting. I hear that everywhere. They're really hurting. They're grieving. But I just tell people, you got to hang in there with the masks and the social distancing. I know that you know, a lot of people don't want to hear that. And somebody's making it up and it's not true and all the rest. But I don't think that's politics. I don't have anything to do with Democrats and Republicans. That doctor who's treating COVID patients, she just barely got through that press conference where she was asking people, you know, we're dealing with all these variations and the like, but just don't give up now. Now, with respect to the specifics of who's getting it and when, as you know, Oregonians know, those are decisions essentially made at the state level. My view is that my job is to get as much vaccine out across the country as we can. And I disagreed with Donald Trump about using the Defense Production Act. I think we should have been using it more aggressively. I told him all that. 
He said, look, we can't even figure out who's in charge of the program. One day is Jared Kushner, and the next day is somebody else. But that's all been done. Now we got to get a good distribution plan. I think in the Recovery Act, in the um, uh, direction that the Biden administration has been taking, I think it's getting the product that's needed out. We can get more, but I think this is really down to the nuts and bolts of distribution. And you know, I saw the announcement about the schools and the like. So I think progress is being made, but there's a long way, long way to go. And I will tell you, if there is one thing that I could say to people who haven't been vaccinated up to this point, I'd say, just look for yourself. Because there are a lot of facts out there that aren't political. You've got friends and neighbors who got vaccinated and all the horrible things that some people were predicting didn't happen. Oregonians are great making up their own minds. They get the facts, they get the information, and I'll trust them, and I'll trust that they'll get vaccinated. Thank you, Senator. I think we have time for one last question um, from a local venture capitalist who's saying, Thank you for your hard work. Do you see startup businesses as a way to increase resilience and accelerate recovery? And how can we leverage federal funds to seed these efforts? Well, that, that's the SBA, my friend. And we just um, confirmed a new head of the SBA who, if that person you know, was here, would say, look, you know, our focus is on trying to get seed capital and access to exactly the people that you're, you're talking about. I mean, I can just tell you, I'm sitting in Southeast Portland and uh, I don't know, maybe four or five blocks away is where Phil Knight you know, grew up, the founder of Nike. And I think we all remember, you know, Phil Knight was in his kitchen with his waffle iron and that's how Nike became a colossus, one of the world's biggest, you know, employers. Wasn't always big, didn't just kind of pop out of the refrigerator and it was enormous, started out with a waffle iron. So for those small businesses, I want you to know, you are the focus of what I work on in policy and I'll bring up a controversial topic, um, Katie, a lot of people, may know that I'm the author of Section 230, which is the major federal bill that essentially lays out some of the ground rules for the big social media platforms. And we all just hate all the slime and the hatred and the racism and the like. By and large, allowed by the First Amendment, not by any kind of federal law. But my focus was always from the very beginning on the small business, because it's the person who doesn't have access to much capital, who can't afford to be tied up in litigation and frivolous kind of actions that keep them from getting their ideas off the ground. So if you look at my bent, particularly in areas like technology, 230, was never about big guys. Big guys can take care of themselves. The internet is not just you know, Facebook and Google, but all those people with dreams and hopes. And I wanna make sure they have a fair chance to get them off the ground and their ability to compete isn't kind of crushed by the big guys. And the big guys have been very open to doing that in the past because they got in there when they were small and grew and uh, they don't want the competition. Think small, everybody. They're where it's at. They're, they're where innovation always comes from. Yeah. And here in Bend and in Central Oregon, we embrace innovation quite a bit. It's how we got to where we are now. We are now. Senator, I really want to thank you for your time. It's always a pleasure talking with you and your openness. And again, we provide the transcript of all of the questions to the Senator's staff. I'm sure there'll be ongoing conversations after today. 
We also want to thank Ben Broadband and hope there's more of the broadband in the future for um, sponsoring our webinar today and bringing this to a wide, wide audience um, of Central Oregonians. And Senator, again, thank you so much for your time and glad you're back in Oregon for a little bit. Look, look forward to seeing everybody in Central Oregon in a few days. You bet. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.